chapter 2, if you would please, Colossians chapter 2. Going back to our teaching in the book of Colossians. And uh, Ed said, how long is it going to take you to get to this book of Colossians? I said, I don't know. He says, well, man, we're going with one verse at a time, one verse a Sunday. It's going to take a while. So Ed will be glad to know that we're going to handle about six verses, Lord knows. <laughs> so rather than just one, we're going to tackle several verses, I trust, Lord willing. For Colossians, we've been uh, just been a heavy, heavy dose on the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that He is everything. He is all in all. He is the great creator of the universe. He is God, very God. And Colossians has given us a big dose of that in contradistinction to any other false god that might arise. So as we look at Colossians 2, I want to uh, uh, draw your attention to verse 3. We're going to start in verse 9. But every one of you should have underlined Colossians 2, 3. In whom, that is in Jesus Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That is a powerful verse. You can go back to that. You can go back to that. You don't need any, you don't need, uh, the, the, you know, the Gita Govinda. You don't need the Banishets of the, uh, you know, you don't need, uh, you don't need uh, some guru to teach you something uh, hidden that nobody else knows. In Jesus Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And that's why I love when, when you get into the stream bed of thought that, that we're in here at the Church of Kauia and other ministers, the Word of God just opens up and opens up and opens up. And there's so much. We'll never get through the teaching of it all because there's so much in the Word of God and in Jesus Christ. We're hit all those treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So now we look at verse 9 where we start today, and it's another verse that you should have underlined. For in Him... Yep. That is, Jesus Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In that body, that we'll look at in just a minute, dwell and dwells today all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's a powerful verse. It speaks to the centrality of Jesus Christ. The ultimacy of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, in Him, the in him is emphatic in the Greek there. In Christ, nowhere else. Well, it's good we do word studies in the Greek and Hebrew because sometimes they give us a little bit more umph and a little more punch than sometimes the English can do for us. So in him and in him and Christ alone, nowhere else, it is in him that dwells all the fullness. The fullness is the unbounded powers and attributes of God. You want to know, we, 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 you know, we think of God and just He's beyond our comprehension. He's infinite. Well, in Jesus Christ is the, the infinite resonance and resonance of all the might and power of Almighty God. After the resurrection, that's why He can stand up and say, All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go, make disciples, baptize, and so forth. So in Him, that is, Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. Godhead in the Greek, we understand it as his, the essence of divine being. All that God is. The Bible says that he was given the Holy Ghost, that he's given the Holy Spirit without measure in Jesus Christ. You and I as Christians, we are tabernacles, temples of the Holy Spirit. But we have the Holy Spirit in varying degrees, just in small measure. But in Jesus Christ, he had the Holy Spirit in full and complete measure. It, the Godhead dwelt in Him, complete, the total essence of God. Christ is not God-like. He is God. Very, very big difference there. Christ is not God-like. He is God. Some of you would recall about uh, 12 years ago or so when uh, George W. Bush was running for president the first time, and in, in, a, in a debate, in a candidate's debate forum, some of you would remember this, they asked the candidates, who's your favorite philosopher? Does anybody remember what George Bush said? Jesus Christ. Anybody want to recall what George Bush was your favorite philosopher? Yeah, Jesus Christ. He said Jesus Christ. Now, I got all the hackles that, the, 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 you know, the reporters got really upset with that. We can't bring Jesus, we can't bring religion into this thing, because George Bush said Jesus was his favorite philosopher. He's not a philosopher. But Alan Keyes stood up uh, some time later, or maybe I can't remember if it was in that very debate, and he said, Jesus is not a philosopher. Jesus is God. Amen. Big, big difference. 
We might have nice feelings about Jesus, but those nice feelings can cause us to crack hell wide open. We must understand that He is God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man gets into eternal life but by Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He, see, he made that. That's a good thank you for the response. He made that. Jesus sets the division. I, I've, said, I've said before that Jesus Christ is the most intolerant man that ever walked the face of the universe because he is the dividing line and he said, I am the divine, I am the way, the truth, and the life. See? And he told, the, he told the Jewish followers of Israel there, unless you believe that I am he, the Son of God, the Messiah, you will die in your sins. You see? You have this thing about being tolerant, being tolerant. We understand that the modern word about being tolerant is just an old, in fashion intolerance of Christianity. We're tolerant about this perversion. We're tolerant about that perversion. We're tolerant about that crazy lifestyle and this crazy thing. But we're not tolerant of who Jesus Christ is in Christianity. You see, that's what's happened in, in America today. So Christ is not godlike. He's not a great philosopher. He is very God himself that walked on the face of the earth. He is God, and the Bible says that in Him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I want to take a couple of you to take a look at a couple of verses where we can see that. So hold, put a marker in Colossians two if you would. Let's go to Hebrews chapter ten. We look at two verses. Talk about Jesus Christ and Him in His body. Hebrews chapter ten and verse five. Wherefore, when he, that is Jesus, was coming into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate existent state as God with the Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwelling together in what we know as the doctrine of the Trinity. We see that in Genesis 1.1. Let us, the, the Godhead with conversation amongst themselves, let us make man in, get the, get the plural there, Amen. not singular, our image, discussion within the Godhead, Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Ghost talking with one another. Let us make man in our image. And so Jesus is talking here in his pre-incarnate state as he's coming into the world, and he says, a body thou hast prepared me. Now, look at uh, 1 Timothy 1, 1 Timothy chapter, or excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 3. It's a verse that we like to use at the church of Korea quite a bit. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And verse 16. This is the fragment of a hymn, a nativity hymn, We're all the way back in Bible time. And without controversy, great is the mystery. It's still, even to the Apostle Paul, he can't get his, we can't grasp it fully. What is it that you and I, what is it that even the Apostle Paul said, it's a mystery of godliness. And, and that mystery that Paul can't even wrap his head around totally is that the infinite God was manifest in the flesh. That's the doctrine of the incarnation. Celebrated at Christmas time. Justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. I have to laugh. Let me just take a, a little tributary here to side for a moment. At Christmas time, usually uh, end, of, end of November, 1st of December, we get these radio, certain amount of radio preachers and a certain amount of people within the uh, Patriot, the Christian Patriot movement. No, oh, they lambast the celebration of Christmas. Oh, we can't have that paganism, in, you know, creeping into the churches of America. And you know, they oh, we can't have all we can't have this. And all the pagan origins of, of of Christmas, and they go on and on with their super uh, uh, revelation and understanding that the church world is in, in great error. I tell you what, if if it was so pagan, then why is it that the pagans can't stand Christmas? It's, right. If Christmas is so pagan, why is it that the public school system says we can't have it in there anymore? Amen. We don't have Christmas break anymore. It's now winter break. Yes. They don't want that word Christmas before the people. That's because the mystery of godliness in the incarnation at Christmas time is the celebration of God manifest in the flesh and every Christmas we celebrate God manifest in the flesh and the world it chaps their hide and they don't like it. 
Amen. Amen. That's right. They don't like it. And so, and then we got Christians come on the scene and they say, we can't celebrate Christmas because, you know, Santa Claus and reindeer and blah, blah, blah. Hey, God does wonderful things and man perverts certain things. We understand that. Who made me a ruler? You a ruler over me. But God was manifest in the flesh. That's what we're talking about here. In body. In that body that God prepared for Jesus dwelt God of very God. It's a beautiful thing. And we must be careful in referring to the divinity of Christ and omitting the deity of Christ. We don't usually... It's okay if you do, but we, there's a technical point here I'm making. If we refer to the divinity of Jesus Christ rather than the deity of Jesus Christ, we can have a problem. What's the difference? Divinity of Christ refers to degree. The greatest, the Jehovah's Witnesses would say, yes, Christ, they would talk about the divinity of Christ, and they would say uh, that Christ is the highest created being of the Father. Jehovah's Witnesses. All right? And they change, they have to change John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the New World Translation, we have it in the Research Center. And they say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. A God. The highest, the highest God-like creature, but not God. And so they have to pervert the translation there of John 1.1. 1, 1. The difference is, divinity refers to degree, Deity refers to kind. That is, deity alone is reserved. Jesus Christ is God alone. All right? Deity. Not just a, not, not that he was divine like qualities, or he was almost, he's the most like God any of us can look at, though he was God himself here on the earth. Deity did not descend upon Jesus, then leave him. Open your Bibles to Hebrews. Let's go back a few pages to Hebrews chapter 1. If you're just in Hebrews, let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in different ways, divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, just pause really quickly there, people say, oh, we're in the last days, and Jesus is going to come back any minute. Hey, Book of Hebrews says we were in the last days way back then. And those last days that, he, that, that the author of Hebrews is talking about here is those days in the transition period between the offering up of sacrifices, the lamb, the turtle dove every year, and Jesus having been crucified and offered up as the sacrifice. The last days was the end of that Old Testament era of sacrifices, and the new day coming on is the new day that you and I are walking in right now where Jesus Christ is our sacrifice. Jesus Christ is our temple. Jesus Christ is our altar. He is everything to us. And the Old Testament, the believers at this particular time, around 64 AD, they were struggling with the notion. They believed that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins, but for generations and generations and generations, they had to offer up a lamb or a turtle dove for their sin, and they were trying to mix the two together. We call that syncretism. They were trying to bring that those two aspects of worship together. And so God said, you know, you guys are struggling with this in these last days. And here's what I'm going to do. Here's one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to destroy the temple in Jerusalem. So you're not going to get confused about having to go there anymore. Not one stone is going to be left upon another. It's going to be totally flattened, totally destroyed. So now you're going to get the message that no more are having to bring turtle doves. No more of that kind right. of stuff. Because Jesus has fulfilled it all. All right? So in these last days, he spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. He made the worlds. All right? And so it's God that did this, and that's Jesus Christ, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. That's the singularity of unity within the Godhead. And upholding all things by the word of his power. How does the world exist right now? How is how are we suspended in space and the earth doing in the and stars and the motions of the sun and all those kinds of stuff? By the word of Christ's power, by his his word. In the beginning was the word, and the Lord spoke and created, and God said, Let there be light. Same thing is happening today. The worlds are held in existence by the spoken word of Jesus Christ, the Logos. 
when by the word of his power, when he had by himself the work that Jesus did on Calvary's cross for you and I, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That sitting down on the right hand of majesty on high is a very explicit term talking about the, the deity reigning in Jesus Christ today in heaven in that body. Go, go forward a few more pages to 1 John chapter 3, if you would, please. I will make a little point here. 1 John chapter 3. John the Beloved wrote, Behold what manner of love, we sing this chorus sometimes, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear at the second coming, okay, final coming of Christ, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We only see him in glimpses today. My vocabulary is limited in how I can express the glory of Jesus Christ. But there'll come a time when we'll see him, the Bible uses the term face to face. Okay? And in that way we'll see him in all his beauty and all his greatness and we'll worship him forever and forever. But it's now we are the sons of God. We are not God. It's important to note here, we are not God. We do not share the essence or attributes of God. Because we're born of his spirit, because we're sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, doesn't make us omniscient now. I don't know everything. You don't know everything. Doesn't make me omnipresent. I can't be everywhere. Jesus, in, as He works through the Holy Spirit, can be everywhere because He is Spirit. Okay. So we are not God, as some, uh, as the Mormons would teach. We're not little gods. We don't have those attributes of God. But let's distill the elements. In Jesus Christ, there is no fuller nor more comprehensive revelation of God than He. That's what I'm trying. That's what that's what we're trying to share here. In Jesus Christ, there is no fuller nor comprehensive revelation of God than He. Now, as an aside, I'll just touch on it as we get ready to move on here now in Colossians. That deity, that deity, Almighty God, dwells in a body condemns any contempt for the body and things material. That's a heavy statement. Let's talk about it a minute. That deity or that God dwells in a body. That God prepared an earthly body like ours. Except it doesn't have a sin nature because, you know, the Holy Ghost conceived in Mary, all right? All of us are born with the sin nature. Jesus Christ was not. But it still had a body, just like you and I that got thirsty, suffered, so forth. That deity dwells in a body condemns any contempt for the body and things material. Where am I getting at? How many of you ever saw a, uh, or heard and you read about uh, Catholic uh, monks that would go up in a cloister somewhere and they would not eat? Or they would, uh, uh, well, you can, you can still do this down in South America today. There's a place where my dad went down there, and you can see where, where they'll walk on their knees up this huge set of steps to an altar up there. And, they, and they're, they're subjugating their body. They're putting their body down as if the body was something evil. You've got to, you know, the, the monks and, and the uh, sages in India, and they'll sit there and they deny their body any food because the body is bad. No, 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 the body is not bad. The Bible says when he, God created everything, he said it was good. And that, well, this was the, the difficulty at this time in the, in the church in, in Colossae, was people had, there was a huge movement that said, the body is evil, and we have to subject the body to all kinds of uh, rituals and deny the body all kinds of things because it's, 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 it's bad. And how could God dwell in something that's bad? This was the debate. This was, I mentioned to you a few weeks ago at the Nicene Council, uh, that it was Christological in its debate. It didn't have other things that, that, that was attributed to it. And the council at Nicaea, what we owe a debt of gratitude to them for, was that they said that Jesus Christ was both all God and all man. That's it. 
I don't, I don't, we don't follow Nicaea and other subjects, and, but they said there, because it was a debate, who is Jesus? Is he all man with a little bit of God in him? Was he all God walking on the face? Because they could not comprehend that God could dwell in a body, because to them body and sin were kind of synonymous. So that's what we're getting at here. That Jesus Christ could dwell in a body, condemns any contempt for the body and things material. So we, you don't have to, none of you have to make a pilgrimage on your knees out there in that, <laughs> that blacktop parking lot that's all broken up to try and abase your body to please God. It, does, it doesn't work that way. All right, so now let's go to Colossians and look at some other material. All right, so we talked about for in Him, that is Jesus Christ, dwell of all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Verse 10, And you are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and powers. Nobody higher than Jesus Christ. Complete in Him, writes Calvin, does not mean that the perfection in Christ is transfused into us. We're not perfect beings. As I said, Christians aren't perfect, they're forgiven. But there are resources. There are resources. That's what Bart was getting at in his talk. There are resources in Jesus, in Him, which we may be filled, that nothing be wanting us. Old English word, that nothing be lacking. We're not lacking in any way because we have in Jesus all that we need. So we sing, some of you remember the chorus we sing. He's all I need. He's all I need. Jesus is all I need. You see that? Everything that we need is in Him. So that's what uh, Paul is getting at here in verse 10. You're complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So... We have a circumcision then if we have a circumcision that is made without hands, then logically there would be a circumcision that is made with hands. Okay, that would just be a logical step we can make that. In whom you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Paul says in Ephesians that there's a true holiness. If there's a true holiness, there's a false holiness. Okay? So what is this circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh? by the circumcision of Jesus Christ. Okay, so there's a lot being said here. If we, and everybody here, all of, everybody five years, ten years old or older knows about the circumcision made with hands or the, four, the foreskin is cut away, all right? But Paul says, I'm not talking about that sign, but that sign, it's important that, that you know, that was ingrained in the Hebrew people for a couple of thousand years. All male children on the eighth day, would become circumcised. And isn't what a wonderful thing that, why was it the eighth day? Well, modern science now tells us that on the eighth day, vitamin K comes into the little boy's body. So that's when they get circumcised. When they, when they That's how they did it. Now, if we want to circumcise, I'm just off here a little uh, <coughs> tributary. If we circumcise today, when a baby little boy is born on the first day or the second day, what do they have to do? They right. have to give that baby a shot the vitamin K, otherwise he'll bleed too much. Mm -hmm. He can't stop the bleeding. So the vitamin K comes in. Yes, sir? Just as a side note, <clears throat> that vitamin K, I had to special order it without aluminum for my two kids. So anybody that's having a child, do not under any circumstances take that vitamin K shot unless you read the ingredients. They oh. put microfine aluminum in there. Very interesting. So you can bypass the aluminum if you do some homework. Very right. okay. Very interesting. So, but God said on the eighth day you'll take the little boy. It's okay, well, I just, isn't that wonderful? We just obey God. Sometimes we don't understand why, but if God said, you know, to do it at that time, they did it on the eighth day, and now we know today why God said on the eighth day that you do that. And by the way, Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day in fulfillment of the law, because he had to fulfill the law in every way. Warren? Yes, sir. On the eighth day, the child will not believe like you would have been later. So, so yeah, and or, or yeah, right, or later, if it got older, yeah, you can kind of go kind of go both ways there. So there is the circumcision of the flesh, but now let's talk about the circumcision of the heart. That's what we want to get to. Open your Bibles, hold your hand in Colossians 2, and open to Romans chapter 2, if you would please. So we're talking about what is the circumcision not made with hands, 
And Paul is going to tell us in Romans chapter 2 what is the circumcision that is not made with hands. Romans chapter 2. Get this, uh, get this grasp in your mind because the church world has a hard time with this, these two verses here. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. All right. What Paul's saying here, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, a covenant man, in covenant with Almighty God, a covenant woman, in covenant with Almighty God. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that of the heart. So the circumcision not made with hands is the circumcision of the heart. A heart change. In the spirit and not in the letter. The letter was eight day. Get the little voice from that. Whose praise is not of men, but of God. So we need to have our heart changed. A heart circumcision. Right, now let's go back to Colossians if you would, please. In whom you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Jesus Christ does this work and changes our heart. Putting off the body of sins, only God can do that through the power of the cross and his shed blood on Calvary's cross for you and I. By the circumcision of Christ. So, Christ literally performs, as it were, an operation in our heart. And we become a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's why James could say, or Peter, not uh, Peter, not being born of corruptible seed. You and I are each born here of corruptible seed, because that is we're going to die. Death sentence is upon us, unless the Lord would come back. But being born of incorruptible seed. So inside us, the circumcision of the heart is a being born again internally, and that makes you, and that makes me a new creation in Christ Jesus. Everybody follow that? Okay, that's what he's talking about here. That's what we are, the new creation in Christ Jesus. Verse 12. We're buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. The, the Bible says the, the Holy Ghost raised up Jesus from the dead. It was a thus testifying that Jesus offering of himself as the Lamb of God, which would take away your sins and mine, the Lamb of God which would take away the sins of the world, that Jesus paid the offering price in full. He satisfied, satisfied the righteousness of a Holy Father in full in his death on Calvary's cross. And so in testimony to that, the Holy Spirit raised up Jesus from the dead on the third day, and God saying, yes, I've accepted the offering of my Son. So, buried with him, what does it mean to be buried with him in baptism? This is not, water baptism is a picture of this, but this is not what he's talking about here. Buried with him in baptism. If we had a situation in Three Rivers, let's say we have a breakdown of society. And now martial law has been declared. And those of you that have been uh, practicing at arms and, 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 and exercising your skill at arms, now we have some kind of invader that comes in, and we have a lawless gang that is raping and pillaging in the foothills area. And we meet that lawless gang, and they have their weapons of warfare, and we have our weapons of warfare, and it's mano a mano, it's gun on gun, and we actually take fire, and we actually deliver fire back. That will be known as our baptism of fire. fire. All right. Some of you have actually seen combat, and you have actually experienced what is known as the baptism of fire. All right. So what is? It's an experience that takes place that you haven't had before, and so now the group has had their first baptism of fire. All right. And they, they know what it's like to have all that going on. So buried with him in baptism is the same within Jesus Christ. He did that work of salvation, of begetting a new creation, a new creature. Changing our heart, giving us being born again of incorruptible seed, it's known as a baptism. That's, that, that's, what, that's the terminology he's using here. And he says, the faith of the operation of God, through God doing that work, in you and I. How are you born again? God does the work. We believe his word, and he does the work in us. For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves even, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
All right. So when God raised him from the dead, Jesus has the power to deliver you and I, to save you and I, to circumcise our hearts. Hallelujah. Verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened. The word there, quickened, it means to make alive. Quickening power. It makes alive. Together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So our bodies were dead as, as if there was a, a trend that we were walking. Matter of fact, Paul uses the imagery that someone that doesn't know Jesus Christ, they're a walking dead man or a walking dead woman. Why? Because the sense of death is upon them. If, let's say, for instance, Warren Luke, just for an example, and we were in the olden days, and Warren Luke had uh, committed murder, and he got caught with it, and, the, and then the judgment is pronounced upon him, and the judge says, you have committed murder, you're unrepentant, uh, in ten days hence, you're going to be taken to the place of execution, you'll be, and you'll be hung. We would say to him, he's a dead man at this pronouncement of the sentence. We don't say that today because <coughs> today because we're doing, we have unbiblical law. Uh, Warren Luke giving the example here, taking the same example, he might have 30 years to fight this appeal, appeal, yeah. appeal, yeah. appeal. Yeah. So he's not a walking dead man. But in the old days, you've only got a week or 10 days, you're a walking dead man. You're as good as dead now because the sentence has, and it will be executed speedily. Now what has happened, according to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes says, because judgment, is not executed speedily. The man on death roll, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. Charles Manton still with us today, right? Because judgment is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of men are set to do evil. All kinds of evil is perpetrated. All kinds of robberies, all kinds of murders are perpetrated because some guy says, oh, the chances are I'll get out of this. They probably won't even catch me to begin with. And even if they do catch me, I'll get a lawyer and I'll fight it and I'll fight it and I'll fight it and I'll fight it and I'll, fight it, and I'll probably get out. Nice but if judgment, now. yeah, if judgment is executed speedily, we don't have to bar our windows. Yeah, Mike. Yeah. Well, according to Thomas Jefferson, once a, murder, uh, a murderer was convicted, he was to be executed the next day, unless it was Sunday, and it'd be Monday. So they even had it the next day. Yes. A lot of examples are within seven days. Okay. So he's a he's a he's a, he's a walking dead man. But do you see the the beauty and the power of the Word of God, because judgment is not executed speedily. Well, hearts of men are set to do evil. Why do we go through cities uh, in, in America and all these poor people in their houses are all barred up? You can go down. I got this street in uh, in Delano. And Warren Lucas used to be his favorite restaurant was La Barca. We like those little hole in the walls. Early so Mart. Been early Mart. Early Mart? Okay, in Early Mart. And you go down the street where La Barca is to get the uh, torta. Does anybody want a torta this morning? <laughs> all right, so they used to have these great tortas in, La, in, in Early Mart. And you go down the street... And all these homes have bars and fences around it. My dad used to say that he lived in downtown Los Angeles, or close to downtown Los Angeles, and in the 20s, and in the 20s, when he was living in 30s in downtown Los Angeles, you didn't have to lock your doors. What has happened? Because judgment is not executed speedily, swift justice, therefore the hearts of men are set to do evil. Yeah. What, what verse is that? Uh, it's in Ecclesiastes. The book is Ecclesiastes. It's going to be around 9 or 10, 11. It's Very important verse. I'll find three awkward that it can't jump over. Warren? Yes, Brad. You just kept the keys in the car. Yeah, the keys were kept in the car? Yeah. Thank God, is a few people still do that in three hours. Believe it or not. <laughs> I mean, I don't recommend it anymore, but my parents did for 30 years. Get the keys in the ignition. Yeah, at, their, at their house, yeah. So, why? Because... Judgment was executed. All right, we're, we're, we're off the point there. Where are we anyway in here? Uh, buried with him, baptism, who raised him from the dead. Oh, yeah, being dead in your sins and, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he's quickened, that has made us alive together with him. As, as Fred likes to quote, we are ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. We are kings and priests unto God right now. That's the position that Christ has done for us. Verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. There's a song that we sing sometimes on page 288 in the Valleys of Praise. An old account settled. It says, the old account, the account against you and I, the old account was large and growing every day. Aha, uh -huh, he did this, he did this. Oh, it's marked. And I was always sinning and never tried to pay 
But when I looked ahead and saw such pain and woe, I went unto the keeper of that book and I settled it all long ago, long ago. How did he settle it? Down on my knees, long ago, I settled it all. Yes, the old account was settled long ago, and the record of sins against you and against me, that record is clear today, for he washed my sins away, and the old account is settled long ago. So that's what we have here. There was a literal writing out of ordinances, because God is righteous, God is holy, God is just, so people only want to hear the God of love, the God of love. Yes, he is a God of love, for God so loved the world, but he's also righteous, he's also just, he's also holy. And he takes care and satisfies his holiness, he satisfies his righteousness through the work of Jesus on Calvary's cross. Right? His blood means spilled on Calvary's cross, satisfied the holiness and righteousness of God. So we had a writing against us. Oh boy, Warren Mark, he blew it here, he did it here, he did it here. Oh, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. Don't look good for Warren Mark, he's, he don't look good. But it was all washed away, it was all wiped away. On the papyra of, uh, of the book, of God's book, it's washed away. Blotting out the handwriting, see, like you literally take a blotter, you blot it out. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, that was against us, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. That work of Jesus Christ. That's why we should be very, very, when we have opportunities to just worship God, worship Jesus, pour our hearts out to Him, how can we not be thankful when He did, when He blotted out the ordinances that was against you and against me? And now there's nothing between your soul and the Savior. There's nothing between my soul and the Savior. It's a beautiful thing. That's why, we, that's why we just so worship Jesus. We're so in love with him because he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and nailed it to the cross. And our last verse here, and we'll close. And having spoiled principalities and powers. The Bible says in, in, in uh, the book of Revelation that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Now take, now take Warren Luke again, another illustration. Warren Luke is right here. So Satan is accusing now, this, and Warren Luke is a believer. But Satan likes to accuse Warren Luke before the Father and say, yeah, that Warren Luke, he's a hothead. Or that Warren Luke, he did it here. He did that. He did that. You see, he's the accuser of the brethren. But now Jesus Christ has taken away the teeth, the arguments of Satan against you and against me. He's no good. He'll never amount to anything. Those arguments have been taken away. And Jesus says, Father, he is mine. He is my son. He's my daughter. This is my daughter. Satan, you have no, you have no legal. Here's the point. You have, Satan, you have no legal access or authority to accuse John and Joan and Jim and Yvonne and so forth. No legal excuse there, because Jesus spoiled the principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. William Barclay in his commentary, now he explains this, I think you'll, you'll see it really clearly here. What does this mean? He spoiled principalities and powers, that's the devil and all kinds of authorities, people making accusations against us. Well, Paul can say in Romans 8, who shall lay anything, who shall lay any charge? charge. Yes, Frederick. Charge to God's elect, it is God that justifies us. Who shall lay, who can make a char charge against you and you and you and you and me? It's God that justified him. We can make a charge. All right. So in closing here, William Barclay says, One of the great picture flashes on the screen of Paul's mind. Jesus has stripped the powers and authorities and made them his captives. As we have seen, the ancient world believed in all kinds of angels and all kinds of elemental spirits. Many of these spirits were out to ruin men. It was they who were responsible for demon possession and the like. Definitely believe in the demonic world. They were hostile to men. Jesus conquered them forever. He stripped them. The word used is the word for stripping the weapons and the armor from a defeated foe. Give me that. Jesus says, give me that. See, demonic host. Once and for all, Jesus broke their power. He put them to open shame and led them captive in his triumphant train. When a Roman general had won, this is the time in which Paul was living, when a Roman general had, had won a really notable victory, 
He was allowed to march his victorious armies. We've given you this illustration before. The Roman general was allowed to march his victorious armies through the streets of Rome, and behind him followed the kings and the leaders and the peoples that he had vanquished. They were openly branded as his spoils. Spoils of war. Paul thinks of Jesus as a conqueror enjoying a kind of cosmic triumph. And his triumphal procession are the powers of evil beaten forever for everyone to see. In these vivid pictures, Paul sets out the total adequacy of the work of Christ. Now we'll distill the elements to close. What is it? In these pictures, Paul sets out the total adequacy of the work of Christ. That's the distilling of the elements. Sin is forgiven. Evil is conquered. What more is necessary? There is nothing that Gnostic knowledge and Gnostic intermediaries, these, these teachers at this time that were known as the Gnostic group, that had to give you special revelation in order for you to get close to God. I said, no, 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 no. There is nothing that Gnostic knowledge, Gnostic intermediaries can do for men. Christ has done it all already. Amen? Christ has done it all already. Just believe it by faith. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I, I thank you, Jesus, that, uh, that in you dwell all the fullness of the God in Father. I thank you that we are complete in you today. That we have all the resources at our disposal, Lord, as we look to you. Help us to look to you for all things, Lord God. Equip us, Lord, for the battles that we fight. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.